Welcome. Welcome to Casper. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, can you all hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Great. All right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to be here. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, part of uh, what I did for my PhD, which I conducted at the University of Zurich and uh, which I finished last year. And the part that I want to talk to you about today is uh, my work on the extraordinarily long-necked thoracic reptile uh, Tenostrophius. So for those of you who are not aware of Tenostrophius, uh, it's a very remarkable uh, reptile that is, as you can uh, see, you know, at a glance, uh, that is characterized by an extremely elongated and stiffened neck. But the interesting aspect of this neck is that it is uh, quite different from other long-necked animals. So you have, for instance, plesiosaurs, these long-necked plesiosaurs we've been looking at, they've elongated their necks by basically increasing the number of neck vertebrae that they have. And instead what Tenostrophius uh, has is it has a very conservative number of uh, uh, neck vertebrae, only 13, but it has extremely elongated these vertebrae. So uh, some of the larger specimens uh, of Tenostrophius can, up, uh, can be up to five or six meters long. And some of these individual vertebrae can be uh, 30 to 40 centimeters long. So these are very, very long uh, elongated structures. And in addition to that, the uh, cervical uh, below these uh, neck vertebrae are these very thin structures, which are actually the cervical ribs or the neck, the neck ribs. And they can be even, or they are even longer than these uh, vertebrae. They can span the length of up to three or four of these vertebrae. So what happens is that underneath uh, uh, the, sorry, I, something popped up, uh, popped up on my screen. So what happens is that these cervical, uh, cervical ribs, these neck ribs underneath uh, these vertebrae, they um, overlap each other, forming a rigid bundle that actually helped stabilize this neck and strengthen this very long uh, neck. And as you can imagine for such a very weird looking animal, uh, its paleobiology has been quite uh, heavily debated. And there are th uh, two, two main hypotheses, one being that Tenostrophius largely lived on land and use its very long uh, neck to snatch uh, fish and other prey from the water. And the other hypothesis is that Tenostrophius actually lived mostly in the water and caught its prey there. Um, Tenostrophius is a member of a group of reptiles called the Tenostrophidae, which is named after Tenostrophius. And this whole group is basically characterized by a long neck and a slender body, but Tenostrophius is, is the species that, or the, the taxon that shows this most uh, clearly. And the Tenostrophidae themselves are a member of a larger group called the Archosauromorpha, so the stem archosaur. So this is the lineage uh, that leads up to modern crocodiles and birds, uh, as well as dinosaurs. And Tenostrophius is mostly known from uh, the Middle Triassic and specifically the, Teth the Tethys Ocean, the coastal regions of the Tethys Ocean. So here in the bottom right, what I'm, uh, hopefully you can all see my pointer. This was the Tethys. And then on the Western side, we found uh, Tenostrophius remains and on the eastern side in what is modern day China, we also find them. But most Tenostrophius fossils are known from uh, a single mountain, the Monte San Giorgio, which uh, is found on the border between Switzerland and Italy. And it's a middle Triassic uh, Lagerstätte locality. And actually because of its very unique fossils, it has been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, this locality is particularly important for the early evolution of marine reptiles, such as sharp terrigens, uh, ichthyosaurs and thalatosaurs, and just to give you an indication of some of the uh, taxa that we find there, we have uh, a stem uh, crocodilian, a pseudosuchian, uh, called the Chinosuchus. We have a placodont, which is um, this animal with these very large uh, uh, rock-like teeth uh, that uh, Valentin showed at the beginning of his talk. We have anothosaurs, as well as early members of ichthyosaurs, such as Mixosaurus. But when it comes to Tenostrophius, we find two very distinct types of specimens at Monte San Giorgio. Uh, one type being large and the other being small. And historically, these two have been considered as adults and juveniles of the same species, Tenostrophius longobardicus. Uh, but an interesting aspect about these two types is that they are quite different when it comes to their dentitions. So as you can see, both from the, the specimens at the bottom and, and their reconstructions on the right, uh, is that the large uh, morphotype, the large type, uh, has these very large pointy teeth, whereas the small type, uh, in the back of the jaw, it has these tricuspid teeth. So you have these teeth with three lobes rather than uh, just a single point. So something weird is going on there. 
but until now it, it was or until recently i should say it was uh, quite difficult to uh, really compare the, the the skull morphology of these two types because as you can see all these specimens have been extremely flattened uh, during the preservation process which uh, you know obscures many of the morphological features that we want to look at so we try to uh, resolve this by scanning some of these specimens. So this is not the surface scanning that Valentin showed in his talk, but this is a form of CT scanning. So looking inside uh, rock and bone. And we used a particularly strong CT scan scanning machine at the synchrotron at the ESRF in Grenoble in France. And we picked this specimen from the collections in Zurich to scan because uh, it, looks the, it looked the most promising to us. It's a specimen of the large type. And as you can see, it is also flattened like all of the other specimens. But when you look at it from the side, you can actually see that most of the individual bones still seem to be quite three-dimensional. So what it seemed to us that had happened here is that the skull had actually collapsed, but that the individual bones had still maintained their uh, 3D shape. And also because the skull was quite complete, we thought we might get additional information from this specimen. So we scanned it. And here on the right, you can see a digital rendering of the skull. And here in the bottom, well, and here, sorry, here in red, you see a cross section. And this cross section corresponds to here in the bottom, this slice of the CT data. So we have a whole number of slices. And uh, in it, you can see we have a very, very good resolution. We can very easily distinguish the bone, which are these lighter colored elements from the surrounding sediment. And they also look quite three dimensional. So this was quite promising. Just in case you're wondering here at the bottom, this is actually tar, because tar was used to uh, um, secure the specimen in its frame. So what I basically did for the next four or five months is manually segment out all of these bones, basically digitally preparing out these bones out of the rock uh, to eventually come to a complete 3D model, which is the following model. And as you can see, especially if we uh, come to the bottom side in a second, you can see that actually the bones are very nicely three-dimensionally preserved. And also that there are many, many other bones, specific, uh, specifically here in the back, um, that we couldn't see before that were actually preserved. But still, we don't really get an idea of how the skull of this animal would have looked like just because all these bones have been uh, moved around and, and, and the structure of the skull has been lost. So what I then uh, try to do is basically put the skull back together, put these bones back into their original orientation. This turned out to be quite difficult because we had some difficulties identifying uh, some of the skull bones because it actually turned out that the individual skull bones of Tenostrophus are very different from other uh, stem archosaurs. So what we actually did is we 3D printed a number of these bones and kind of played around with them as if they were uh, Legos uh, to try and see how they would fit together. And in the end, we managed to come up with this um, 3D reconstruction of the skull. And as you can see from this one specimen and it's so extremely flattened, we more or less managed to get a complete uh, skull out of it. We are missing a bit here in the interior end of the palate, and we're also missing a bit of the interior end of the snout here. But other than that, most of the skull is complete. There were some elements that were not this, that well preserved. For instance, we have a very, very nicely preserved right quadrate here, but the left version was uh, not that well preserved. So what we did then was simply copy and uh, mirror the uh, bone and then put it in on the left side. And this allowed us basically to, to reconstruct most of this skull uh, uh, as to how it would have looked like back at, uh, when it was alive, which was kind of, which was great because basically the day I finished this model, I, yeah, I felt like I was the first person to see this skull in 240 million years, which was quite a cool uh, feeling. And just to give you an idea of how strong um, these, these, this form of CT scanning or synchrotron scanning can be, I'll, I'll show you some of the morphological details. Obviously, one of the major advantages is that you can manipulate these uh, bones and look at them in, in every angle you want without it being covered by sediment or anything like that. So when we look at the mandible here, the lower jaw, you can see here in the back, we have this adductor fossa, which is the area of the lower jaw where much of the, um, the muscles would have attached that help in closing the jaw. And we were even able to completely reconstruct what is called the atlas axis complex. So it's the, the part of the uh, vertebral column that attaches the neck to the base of the skull. So we have some elements of the base of the skull here, the base occipital, uh, and as well as the left half of the, the brain case here. We managed to fully articulate it with all the elements of the atlas axis complex. And at the same time, we were also able to take this atlas axis complex apart and look at all of these bones uh, individually and from every angle we wanted. So as I just said, we, we managed to also find the brain case. And the brain case is always a very interesting structure to look at because it's very informative. 
So one of the things we discovered in the brain case of Tenostrophius is that it possesses a latrosphenoid, which is marked here. So the latrosphenoid is a bone that we find actually more derived archosauri forms. So these are stem archosaurs that are already more uh, uh, closely related to modern crocodiles and birds. Um, but this uh, did not, we, we did not know that this uh, bone also occurred in even uh, more distantly related stem archosaurs. So this is actually the first evolutionary uh, occurrence of this bone in the stem archosaur lineage. And what was also really great is that based on this uh, partial brain case, we could actually uh, reconstruct uh, the endocast of this brain case. So basically, yeah, the, we, we filled in um, the openings here of the brain case to, to, to reconstruct this endocast. So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, 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 reconstruction of the brain, but it is a reconstruction of the infilling of the brain case. So it does give us a good idea of how the brain might have looked like. So here in yellow, we have some of the cranial nerves that would have uh, um, uh, innervated the, the skull. And uh, here in red, we have the inner ear, so the balance organ of this animal. And uh, this was also quite interesting to see because we, you can see these canals here, which are the semicircular canals that are involved in balance. And we see that they're actually quite slender. And we know from some other marine reptiles that were quite deep diving, like modern sea turtles, that they have much thicker semicircular canals. So this tells us, tells us that Tenostrophus was not an animal that was diving very deep. It might still have been an aquatic animal, but it was not a very, uh, an animal that was living out in the open ocean and, and diving deep down into, into the sea. So based on all this information, we managed to make this new skull reconstruction of the large um, type of Tenostrophius, and then we compared it to a modified version, an updated version of the uh, small type uh, of Tenostrophius. And then you can already, already see at a glance that these, these two things look very, very different from each other. Um, this snout is much more flattened uh, anteriorly. And also when you look at the palatal region, there are major differences. For instance, the small type here has teeth in the palatine and in the pterygoid, whereas this is completely absent in the large type. So this to us indicated that, this, that this, these are not just juveniles and adults of the same species. They are too different for that. And it seems a lot more likely that they are two different species. However, to be certain of this, we wanted to do a bit of additional analysis to really confirm this. So what we did is we did bone histology, what we already uh, looked at in another talk as well. Uh, so basically making a thin section of uh, the femur of one of the specimens of the small type and uh, look at the bone tissue. And uh, what we could see is we could find a number of lines of arrested growth. So these are basically, they work in the same way that um, growth lines in trees work. So they, they represent um, cyclical events uh, a year. So basically we found 20 lines of arrested growth, which would normally suggest an age of at least 20 years. But more important, uh, more, more important than that, we could also find an EFS, the so-called external fundamental system, which you can see here on the outer edge. What an EFS basically is, is that these lines of arrested growth at the outer end of the bone have become really closely compacted together. And this means that towards the end of the life of this animal, its growth had dramatically reduced. So basically it had reached maturity, skeletal maturity. And because this was a specimen of the small type, this showed to us that actually the small type represents a smaller separate species. And because um, the holotype of Tenostrophus longobardicus is actually a specimen of this small type, um, we were able to name the, uh, the large type into a new species, which we call Tenostrophus hydroides, or uh, the Tenostrophus that, that resembles the hydra of uh, Greek mythology. So basically to conclude our research, we found that the skull of Tenostrophius was quite unique. The skull of the, the large species of Tenostrophius, as I said, is very different from other stem archosaurs. And this indicates to us that Tenostrophius was not only very highly specialized in its uh, neck morphology, but also in its skull morphology. And these include very clear uh, adaptations to an aquatic lifestyle. We have now a better idea of the dentition of uh, the large species of Tenostrophius, which very much resembles, uh, for instance, Nothosaurs and other aquatic reptiles. We find that the, the nostrils uh, uh, are positioned at the top of the skull. And we find that the snout is very much flattened towards the ventrally, which is also a typical aquatic adaptation. We find that there are two species of Tenostrophius co-occurring in the same environment that have a very large size difference. We have the large species, Tenostrophius hydroides, that was up to six meters long, whereas Tenostrophius longobardicus was less than two meters long. Uh, 
And also we see these very different dentitions that indicate that these animals were eating very different things. So we, we uh, know that the large species based on its teeth was likely eating slippery play, prey such as fish and cephalopods. And we also know this from some of the stomach contents of some of these specimens. Whereas the small species with its tricuspid teeth, those teeth are generally used for, for crushing uh, harder prey, shell prey. So uh, this species likely fed on invertebrates such as mollusks and crustaceans. And the presence of two species of Tenostrophias uh, in the same environment with such a large size discrepancy and uh, um, uh, such a large size discrepancy and different dentitions indicates to us that they had evolved to uh, feed on different uh, prey sources. And this is quite interesting because this is a form of niche partitioning, which is actually very unexpected for an animal like Tenostrophias because this animal with its extremely uh, long and specialized neck was always considered to be a bit of an evolutionary dead end, something uh, that is the, like giant pandas often considered an animal that cannot do much more with the morphology that it has. But it actually turns out that this extremely long neck was much more uh, evolutionarily adaptable than was previously considered. So coming back to that uh, debate of the paleobiology, our research does seem to suggest that Tenostrophius was uh, a mostly, or at least a large species, Tenostrophius droides was a mostly aquatic animal based on the skull morphology. Um, but in contrast, this uh, uh, reconstruction in which we see Tenostrophius, uh, Tenostrophius actively pursuing its prey, uh, swimming after it, it, it seems more likely to us that Tenostrophius was an ambush predator because in its postcranium, uh, in its limbs, there is not much adaptations for uh, good for for fast swimming, and also its entire uh, body shape with the long neck is not particularly hydrodynamic. So it seems most likely that Tenostrophius used its a short head at the end of a very very long neck to approach its prey uh, without being seen. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, and, uh, colleagues, and co-authors for all their help uh, and work on this project. Uh, and as well as all the people from uh, today's conference for the invitation. Thank you very much.